I've just got to say, I, I really do, and I wanted to make sure it gets on this tape. And this tape will go all over the world. But I, I want people to know about this. Because every time, every time Miss P gets up at the piano, I go back in my mind. I go back in my mind. Rita, you know, exa you know exactly what I'm going to say. When that young lady walked up to the piano and was there for probably how long? Four? No, I think it was about under five seconds. Now, maybe that's an exaggeration, sweetie. But, but every time you tell the story, it's got to be a little bit less, you see. <laughs> How precious that was when she went up there and she was so proud and just so confident. And, okay, we'll, we'll give you the extra five, sweetie. It was ten seconds. And she went up there and it was boom, 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 boom. And she was done and she looked out and smiled. You know, and everybody said, Amen. And now today, she walks up there and she can play any song. And if you listen carefully when she's playing, like that song we just sang, Praise to the Lord, she had every, every part of it. It was just right there, right there. And, uh, you know, there is an incredible lesson in that, an incredible lesson. And I often think about it in my own life. Is that if all I have to give to God is 10 seconds. Okay, that's all I have. And that's the best I can do. You know, God accepts that. He accepts that. You know, and, and people get so wound up with, well, I, you know, you gotta call, you got to call God a certain name. No, you don't. God just wants you to call him something because he wants us to be in contact with him. And if it's starting at 10 seconds, folk, God is going to take that and he's going to say, okay, I see that that is your very best. And over time, God will make us a master pianist. And, and our life will be a testament of God's goodness. And uh, that whole story comes out of Miss P's 10-second song. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us. We just pray that you'd help us to manifest kindness, gentleness toward others as you have revealed such kindness and gentleness towards us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it lives today. We pray for your guidance as we study now through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I remember many years ago, I was taking a postgraduate class at Pacific Union College one summer. I was going toward a master's in education. And um, I was taking a class from a doctor of psychology and philosophy and you know, he, had, he was a, a, uh, a very uh, decorated scholar and, and all that. And so we started through the class, and um, he was adamant, adamant, um, that the Bible was uh, a book that, um, you know, talked about history. This was a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, this was at Pacific Union College. And uh, he would wax eloquent about, you know, um, predestination. And, and uh, f 
Finally, we came to the end of the class. And one day he was just, oh, he was so proud of himself and letting all of us students know that um, the Bible was not real for today. It wasn't real. There was nothing in it that applied to our time. Well, folk, there was a student in the class who had had enough and uh, raised, the student raised their hand and said, um, well, sir, what about Revelation 13? What about the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13? And the fact that this lamb-like beast, down at the end of time, would restrict liberty and would seek to enforce a, a worldwide Sunday law. And I said, sir, anybody, and this is where the student's grade dropped considerably, from a straight A down to eventually a B plus in the class. But the student said, anybody with half of a brain can see the fulfillment of Revelation 13 in our very day. Well, you could have heard a pin drop in that room as the professor um, stared darts at the student. Folk, doesn't matter how many doctorates uh, a person gets, doesn't matter how much worldly knowledge a person may have, um, if it's not in subjection to the Word of God, that wisdom is absolute foolishness. Foolishness. This passage of Scripture, folk, lives... And you can see it unfolding every single day on the news, in the newspapers, magazines, speeches of politicians. These verses live. They live. Because John was shown our day. And we're going to look at it this morning. Lambs, dragons, images. Next slide. Revelation 13, 11 says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Strange creature, you know. A lamb that says, bah, that runs away from a conflict that, that you know, as they say, is very sheepish. You know, they're very docile. But the Bible says that this lamb-like beast... So we know it's a nation because beasts in Bible prophecy, this is the Greek word is therion. It means a ravenous beast. It starts off docile and, and little and lowly and gentle and kind, but it ends up speaking with fire. Now that's an interesting dichotomy there. How could a lamb breathe fire? When's the last time you saw a lamb, you know, out in somebody's farm breathing fire? That, that just doesn't happen. Well, that tells you the, the stark contrast in the profession of whoever this power is, which we will identify, but it starts off so hopeful, and it ends up breathing fire. Next slide. Now, the Bible is very clear we're not doing based on what we think. It's not a I think proposition here, folk. It's this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that a beast in prophecy from Daniel 7, 17, and 23 is a world power. It's a nation. So we're dealing here in Revelation 13 with a nation or a world power. And the Bible says it comes out of the earth. Now the first beast in Revelation 13, 1, if you remember, it said, John said, I saw it come out of the sea. And Revelation 17, 15 told us that the sea or the waters 
represent multitudes of nations and peoples. Well, this second power that rises out of the earth, it rises up in an area of the world where there aren't a lot of people, where there aren't a lot of nations. So the first beast in Revelation 13, 1, rises up in the old world where there have always been, throughout the history of humanity, there have always been nations. There have always been powerful countries. But the second one comes up in an area of the world where there aren't existing nations, where there aren't world powers. So this second world power in Revelation 13, 11, must rise up in the new world. The first one rose in the old, the second one rises in the new world, in the western hemisphere. And the Bible says that it starts off like a lamb. Now we know in the Bible, throughout the book of Revelation, we noticed in Revelation 5, right around verses 5 and 6, that John saw one in the midst of the throne and he said it was like a lamb that had been slain. So this second power that rises in the new world starts off with Christ-like characteristics. Starts off with a government that is Christ-like. Now what is a Christ-like government look like? Next slide, sweetie. You know, you, you think about this, this terminology, a nation that's like Christ. Well, we don't think of a nation, a ravenous beast. That's not how we'd represent Christ. Nor would we think of him like a fire-breathing dragon. Just don't apply. So what would be Christ-like principles of government? Next slide. These would be the characteristics. Number one. Instead of the nation taking freedom away from its people, it would give its people freedom. They would be able to worship God. They would be able to bear arms if necessary to protect themselves and their families. They would have rights to free trial. They would have rights to free press. And the list could go on and on. But they would be a nation that was free. The nation would keep the church and the state separate because this lamb-like power that rises in the Western Hemisphere would see that through the dark ages when nations and church are joined together, you have bloodshed, you have destruction, you have hatred because when a church gets into power, they begin to stuff it down people's throats. And so this nation would set up a government where the church and state would be forever separate. As Christ said in Luke chapter 20, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. We have, we have certain responsibilities toward government. But we also give to God the things that are God's. But you notice in those responsibilities that we have, the church and the state remain two separate entities. Another characteristic of a Christ-like government, the nation would not persecute those who disagreed with her. See, there would be no persecution for political incorrectness or for religious nonconformity. They, they wouldn't have that in this second beast or world power. Finally, the political power rests with the people. See, throughout the Dark Ages, all nations, it rested with a few people making executive orders, having dictatorial power at the top who would dictate to the people what to do. That's how it was through the Dark Ages. But this lamb-like beast in Revelation 13, 11, it would be a government of the people. The people would have the final say. It would be by the people and for the people. 
So these are the characteristics of a lamb-like government. Can you think of a nation that rose up in the Western Hemisphere that had all of these Christ-like characteristics of a free government? Well, let's see. There's Canada. No, that's not true of Canada. How about Mexico? No, no. Guatemala? No. Nicaragua? Costa Rica? Um, Panama? Ecuador? Argentina? Um, Brazil? Peru? Chile? Paraguay? No, no, it just doesn't fit. Cuba? Yeah, that's a good one, Reggie. <laughs> Folk. It can only be one power. It can only be one power. Next slide. It rises in the West. It gives the people freedoms. The church and state are separate. It's a government of the people by the people. The lamb-like beast can only be the United States of America. It's the only power it can be. Next slide. Now, again... We have seen, we have studied the Bible, we have analyzed the symbols. We used no extra biblical support. Now what does the telescope say? What does the spirit of prophecy say? Did she add something to the Bible? Let's see what she says. Great Controversy 439 and 440. She says, at this point, another symbol is introduced. The prophet said, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. Both the appearance of this beast and the manner of its rise indicate the nation which it represents is unlike those presented under the preceding symbols. The great kingdoms that have ruled the world were presented to the prophet Daniel as beasts of prey, rising when the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. Going on down, but the beast with lamb-like horns was seen coming up out of the earth. Instead of overthrowing other powers to establish itself, the nation thus represented must arise in territory pre pre previously, that should be previously, unoccupied and grow up gradually and peacefully. It could not then arise among the crowded and struggling nationalities of the old world. It must be sought in the western continent. What nation of the new world was in 1798 rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness, and attracting the attention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation and only one meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. Now, somebody may say, oh, well, you just don't like America. Well, folk, I've traveled enough in the world. I've seen enough continents in the world and how other people live outside of the United States. And when I get on the plane to come back to America, I'm grateful. I am grateful. There is no nation on the face of the earth like America. It's the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Does that negate what Bible prophecy says? Of course not. Of course not. Next slide. The lamb-like horns, this is still great controversy. This is 441. The previous quote was great controversy, 439 and 440. The lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States. When presented to the prophet is coming up in 1798. Among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. See, these are Christ-like principles of government. Religious freedom and civil freedom. Their views found place in the Declaration of Independence which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Obviously, folk, while America was lamb-like and the principles were in place, 
tragically, these principles somehow did not apply to all the inhabitants of the United States. They didn't apply to the Indian populations that were here, and nor did they apply to the people who came from Africa. Nevertheless, in document form, in the Declaration of Independence and in the Bill of Rights, no nation in the annals of history have ever put down these principles, ever, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution granted to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted, every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. Next slide. Next slide. Now, we've identified who the beast is. It's the United States of America. It starts off lamb-like. But somehow, folk, in a transition from those lamb-like principles of government, those Christ-styled principles, it would begin to speak as a dragon. So those freedoms that were laid down as the foundation blocks of this republic would be removed. And the Bible says that he, the United States, would exercise all the power of the first beast before him and would cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the Bible says that the United States would exercise all the worldwide power that was exercised by Rome in the first century. And it says that America would have such power in this world that she would dictate to the earth worship and that America would tell the world they need to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, who was the first beast in Revelation 13? The papacy. So the United States would somehow become so united with Rome and that Rome would have such control in America that she would tell America, we've got to tell the world how to worship us. Now, this right here is the key word in all of this, worship. Is this true worship or is this false worship? It's false worship. This is false worship. So America will use its worldwide authority to tell the world to worship the papacy. What will America tell the world to do to honor Rome? Now, folk, again, we're simply... Looking at the symbols. That's all we're doing. Next slide. Let's see. Next slide. Now, what does the Bible have to say about worship? What is true worship? What is false worship? Well, Jesus made it so clear in Matthew 15, 2 to 9. It is so clear. Notice what it says. Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So, folk, the issue here in Matthew 15 is over. Are we going to honor what men have said and what men say? Or are we going to honor what God says? Are we going to follow man-made traditions? Or will we follow God's commandments? God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, 
Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. See, the Jews had this idea that if a, if a child came into a large sum of money, instead of helping out their parents, the child could simply say, Corbin. And Corbin meant it's free, you can't touch it. Give it to the church. That's right, Dennis. That's right. And so what the Jews had done is they made a tradition that was directly contrary to God's command to honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus said, Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Here's the issue, folk, in Matthew 15. It's the commandments of God versus the traditions of men. And then Jesus finished this story saying, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Well, folk, there's vain worship right there. Following man-made commandments. A man-made tradition. True worship, to the contrary, is following God's commandments. Now, if we plug that back in, and if you were to do a study on the word worship or any of its forms, worship, worships, worshipped, or worshipeth, throughout the Bible, you will find every time the children of Israel went into false worship, they had turned away from God's commandments. Every time. So Revelation 13 then, the United States will unite with the papacy and through Rome's influence in America, America would tell the world to honor a tradition that is totally contrary to the Ten Commandments and that tradition the papacy has exalted for centuries. What could it be? What tradition has the papacy set up that is totally contrary to the Ten Commandments and they're going to tell the world to honor at the end of time? Next slide. What could it be? Well, let's listen to the papacy tell us themselves. What tradition of the papacy directly contrary to the Ten Commandments will America exalt? Our Sunday visitor, February 5, 1950. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. The Protestant mind does not seem to realize that in observing Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church the Pope. It's well to remind the Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and all other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church. Those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. The mark of Catholic Church authority in the world is Sunday observance. This is a tradition that has no place in the Bible. It originated with Rome. When we honor the Sunday tradition, we are paying homage to the papacy. Sunday goes directly contrary to the plain teaching of the fourth commandment. Now, folk, what we have just done, we have looked at the Bible we have compared Scripture with Scripture, and then we have used the testimony of history, and in particular the Catholic Church, to tell us exactly what they have done and what they are going to do. The Bible says that America will cause all the world to worship the first beast. America will cause all the world to honor 
the Sunday tradition of Rome. That's what the Bible says. Did we use did we use Ellen White to tell us what the Bible said there? No, folk, the Bible already says that. And Ellen White made it very, very clear. She said, if we had studied our Bibles, there would have been no need for her writings. The fact is, is we have not studied our Bibles, and that's why God gave us her work. Next slide. Great Controversy 442. The statement that the beast with two horns causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship, obey the tradition, the Sunday tradition of the papacy, indicates that the authority of America is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. Such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Now, what does the First Amendment to the Constitution say? Well, it says this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Only in flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty, can any religious observance be enforced by civil authority? But what does the Bible say? It says that America began as a lamb and ended up speaking like what? Like a dragon. So there would come a time in American history when religious freedom would no longer be allowed. And now the government would tell people exactly how they are to worship the God of heaven. And that homage that America would enforce upon its people and upon the world would be in direct obeisance to the Roman Catholic Church system. Next slide. How, how would this power get America to give up its freedom, to give up its Bill of Rights? Well, the Bible tells us how they'll do it. Revelation 13, 13 and 14. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He's going to be able to do miracles. Right in front of us. Right in front of us. People that were blind, they're going to be able to see. People who couldn't walk are going to get up and run. And folk, they're going to be the sweetest, kindest, gentlest, most loving people. And they're going to tell you that the Seventh-day Sabbath is just not important anymore. will deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So there will be miracles. There will be deception. The most cunning and evil deception will be practiced. And in that process, America will make an image to the beast. Now, what is an image? What's an image? If I say my son is a splitting image of his father. Now, he isn't. He isn't. But what does that mean? He's a lookalike. 
He's a likeness. That's right. In America is going to be set up something that will look identical to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is religious. It's a church. So there's going to be some church or church group set up in the United States that just like the papacy will use their power to enforce their beliefs just like Rome did in the Dark Ages. Next slide, sweetie. Notice great controversy in commenting on these verses. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. The inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. All of us will be brought to take their stand. All of us will face these things, folks. You say, Bill, are you setting time? No, I'm not setting time. Maybe some of us will fall asleep. But if we live to see that day, we will see miracles. Miracles right in front of our face. We'll see loved ones. We'll see loved ones. Face to face. I had a lady in Tahoe when I was there. A lady started attending church. I was giving her Bible studies. We came to the state of the dead. She couldn't get by that. She could not get by that. And I said, when a person dies, they go to sleep. That's what the Bible says. And we went through all the verses. She said, no, that's not true. I said, why, why isn't that true? She said, because I saw my grandmother. My grandmother stood at the foot of my bed. She spoke to me. And folk, it didn't matter if I stood on my head, turned purple and green, and showed her those Bible verses. There was nothing I could do for her to understand the truth of the state of the dead. Nothing. We're going to see it, folk. We've got to know. We've got to know what the Bible says. We've got to be in submission to Christ. Next slide. Elijah brought fire down. Ellen White said the devil at the end of time, will bring fire down from heaven. Next slide. This man, of course, you know, there's so many like Benny Hinn throughout the world. People in meetings that, you know, have never walked, or so they say, and he makes them walk. I've always said, well, if, if that was really true, why doesn't this guy go to every rest home and every hospital in America and let, let's see him raise these people up to health? Um, but folk, miracle, these people are working miracles, doing wonders. They're doing wonders. Next slide, sweetie. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power. America has power to give life, to give authority to the image of the beast. So some religious power in America is going to be so closely united with government that this image in America will be the, the force that the papacy will use to do what the papacy did during the Dark Ages. What is this image? Next slide, sweetie. The image, it's a look-alike of the papacy that will be set up in America. This look-alike of Rome will use the state to enforce Sunday keeping in America. This image will persecute those who don't follow their Sunday tradition. Now, can you think of a religious group or group of churches in America that looks just like the papacy? 
They are using their religious power. They're mixing it into government. And they're mixing the church and the state together. And they will one day push Sunday worship in the United States? Folk, it can only be the apostate Protestant churches. We know them today as the evangelical churches in America. That's what we know them as. People like Joyce Myers, Charles Dobson, T.D. Jakes, Billy and Franklin Graham, I don't know this guy, Charles Colson, Rick Warren. Folk, these people are powerful evangelicals. And when God allows them, they will use their political, religious power to change the laws of this nation. Now, after George Bush was elected in 2004 for his second term in office, notice this statement down here in the corner of this Time magazine. What does Bush owe them? Folk, a president owes these evangelicals something? What did he owe them? Why did he owe them something? Well, because these people told their thousands, yea, millions of followers, you vote for this man. How much power did that give to these men and this woman? How much power? Huge power. Huge power. Next slide. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Protestant churches that have followed in the steps of Rome by forming alliance with worldly powers have manifest a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. Now, folk, when we talk about the apostate Protestant churches that keep Sunday, you know, there are sincere people in those churches, individual people. And when the truth is brought home to them about the Ten Commandments and about the Seventh-day Sabbath, the honest in heart will embrace it. They will embrace it. But the denominations themselves are in apostasy and have rejected the commandments of God, the power of Christ, the sanctuary. There will be a great shift. There are many, many Seventh-day Adventists who will one day no longer be Sabbath-keeping Adventists. Next slide, sweetie. When the leading churches of the United States, the apostate Protestant churches, uniting upon such points of doctrine as there are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. See, the image has not been formed yet. But when the apostate Protestant churches influence the state to pass a Sunday law, the image will have been formed. Next slide. This happened before. Larry, how much time do we have left? 14. Great. Great, great. This happened before. You remember on the plains of Dura? What was the issue on the plains of Dura? It was worship. Daniel chapter 3 talks about worship more than any other chapter in all the Bible. 
Eleven times it refers to worship. It was false worship. It was honoring a man-made tradition. And so why did the three young men, they said, we can't bow down to your image. We will not worship the way you are telling us to do. Why? Because that went contrary to God's Ten Commandments. And the young men said, King, you can throw us into the fire, but we will not bow down and honor your image. We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Next slide. And so what happened? All the world was arrayed against those three young men. They were thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. The men who threw the young men into the furnace perished. The heat was too great. They died. But God's children were preserved. Why? Because the Bible says, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt. The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Folk, when we choose, when we choose to do what is right, Whatever the consequence, Christ will be there to take care of us. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. He will be there to take care of all those who will stand for what is right. Next slide. The Lord did not forget his own. As his witnesses were cast into the furnace, the Savior revealed himself to them in person. And together they walked in the midst of the fire. In the presence of the Lord of heat and cold, the flames lost their power to consume. Prophets and Kings 506 to 509. Next slide. Revelation 13, 16, and 17, the Bible says that America will cause all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. The mark of papal authority in this world is Sunday. Economic sanctions will be brought to bear on those who refuse to bow to this sign of papal authority. You say, wait a minute, Bill. How do you get Sunday in your hand or in your forehead? How do you do that? Well, it's very simple. In our forehead is where we think. That's where we think. That's where we make decisions. And so those who embrace Sunday have come to the same decision in their mind, the same decision that Rome has, and that is, I will save myself in rebellion against God's law. That's how I get the mark in my forehead. How about in my hand? Well, folk, with our hands we work. We make a living. We provide for ourselves and our families. We take care of ourselves. Well, if I choose to keep Sunday, then, folk, I'm going to use my hands and I'm going to work to do everything I can to not only set aside God's laws myself, but to try to help everybody else to do the same thing. And that's how I get Sunday in my hand. I'm going to work just as Rome has worked to help people rebel against God. Now that's how I get it in my hand. The 
Catholic Church has made it very clear their mark, which we will read about more in the next chapter in Revelation 14. She says, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Saturday to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. This transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Folk, this is where the world is leading rapidly, rapidly today. Next slide. As it was in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so in the closing period of earth's history, the Lord will work mightily in behalf of those who stand steadfastly for the right. He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain. Angels that excel in strength will protect them and in their behalf, Jehovah will reveal himself as a God of gods, able to save to the uttermost those who have put their trust in him. Next slide. Finally, the number of the beast. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. His number is 600, three score and six. Now, folk, I've heard people say, well, let's see, that was, that's Ronald Reagan. You can get 666 out of Ronald Reagan's name. And it, it represents Barack Obama. And it represented the Queen of England. And it represented, uh, you know, whoever else you want to decide on. Folk, let's be clear. It says it's the number of the beast. And we've already identified who this beast power is. This is the first beast of Revelation 13. And that first beast of Revelation 13 is not Ronald Reagan. And it's not Barack Obama. It's the papacy. So somewhere on papal mitres, somewhere on their regalia, there is some name that when added up comes to 666. It has nothing to do with these other powers. It has everything to do with the first beast that thinks it's God and claims it can forgive sins. This number of 666 has everything to do with the papacy and nothing to do with anything else. It has nothing to do with a computer or a card or, 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 or. It has nothing to do with them. Next slide. What does 666 and the papacy have in common? One of the Pope's names is Vicarious Philae Dei. That means the vicar of God, or the vicar of the Son of God, or the representative of Christ on earth. That is one of the names of the Pope. And if you take each one of those names, Vicarious, then Philae and Dei, the, five, uh, the V equals five, the I is one, the C is a hundred, the A and the R have no numerical value. The I, these are Roman numerals now, obviously. The I is 1. The U is just like the V. It represents 5. And the S is 0. Phi, the F equals 0. The I is 1. The L is 50. The two I's are 1 apiece. Dei, D in Roman numerals is 500. The E is 0. The I is 1. Vicarious came to 112. 
Eli came to 53. Dei came to 501. You add those numbers up and you arrive at 666. The number of the Roman Catholic Church system. Next slide. Folk, what we have studied today is very, it's almost unheard of anymore. You don't hear it. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Because this is the truth, every person on this planet will hear this message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word today that still lives. Thank you that it can still do exactly what it says. Father, I pray for each one of us here and all that will hear this tape. Father, that we would determine in our own heart and mind that come what may, whatever comes, we will stand for what is right, though the heavens fall. Strengthen and bless each one of us, Father, to make that determination in our hearts to walk through fire if necessary, that your name may be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.